8 through 12, Exodus 17. And the word of the Lord today reads, and there it is on the screen for anyone that does not have a Bible in your lap. The King James text today reads, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady, until the going down of the sun. Master, we Exodus chapter 17. First of all, I want you to understand something today. The Word of God says that the Old Testament is types and shadows. In other words, within the context of the Old Testament, we have things that help to illustrate principles and truths that will help us in our walk with God. You do not establish doctrine based upon the Old Testament Scriptures. Why? We're no, longer, we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. Now, there are a lot of so-called Christians, especially in the fundamentalist and evangelical circles, that love to go back in the... we got one character that I saw online who's run around preaching, God told the people of Israel to go kill these people and destroy these people. Blah, blah, blah. And that's justification for us rising up and killing homosexuals in America and killing abortion doctors. And What? What? Um, perhaps you miss Jesus' words when his disciple cut the ear off a soldier who had come to retrieve him in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? Perhaps you, perhaps you uh, have forgotten that the New Testament has a very different message and a very different tenor and a very different spirit to it than the Old Testament did. Perhaps you've forgotten Jesus' words, love your enemies, do good unto them that despise you. Hello now. Oh, but the Word of God, you know, we're being persecuted as Christians. Well, I got news for you, honey. The Word of God tells exactly, exactly how a Christian is to respond to persecution. Guess what? It didn't come from Paul, didn't come from John, didn't come from Peter, didn't come from Bill, didn't come from Jack, didn't come from Henry. It came from Jesus. Do you know what Jesus said? If you're persecuted, he said, flee into another city. Nowhere did he ever, ever, ever justify or call for violence. Nowhere did he ever tell the church, Johnny, to rise up with weapons and defend itself against such persecution. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah, yeah. So you better get your foolishness straight, people. You better get your act right, because if you think for one minute you're going to stand before God in the judgment and wind up having a home in heaven after you have perverted and polluted and twisted His Word to make it say what you want it to say, if you think for one minute you're going to have a place in heaven alongside of me, you're out of your mind. Amen. There is no room in heaven for the disobedient. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. So the, I'm, I'm preaching today from the Old Testament, but I'm, I'm only using that as a type and shadow. I'm using it as a springboard. I'm going to be using New Testament Scripture to help you understand the principle. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's just an example. All right. Having said that, 
Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. While the people of God were traveling through what is referred to literally as the wilderness of sin. They actually journeyed through what is referred to as the wilderness of sin. As they were leaving Egypt and traveling to the promised land. And as they were making this journey, they were assaulted and assailed by an enemy. And the Word of God calls that enemy Amalek. But let me tell you a little secret. In the scriptures you will often see God use a name. As though it were an individual. It is not an individual. Uh, Amalek is not a single individual by any stretch of the imagination. But you know how the Lord refers to Israel? Speaking of the nation of Israel. He also refers to Israel as Jacob. Speaking of the entire nation of Israel. But he refers, he's using the name of the founder, or he's using the name of the one who established that family or that nation. In this case, God is referring to the descendants of a man named Am Amalek. Amalek literally means in the Hebrew, dweller in a valley. Amalek is the son of Elphaz by his concubine Timnah. Grandson, listen now, of Esau and progenitor of a tribe of people in southern Canaan. Therefore, Amalek refers to descendants of Amalek. So who came up, who rose up against the people of Israel in the wilderness of sin? Who rose up against him, against Israel at this place? That is called Rephidim, the descendants of Amalek. Well, brother, there's, what, okay, fine, big deal. So now we know who attacked Israel. What significance is there in that? I'll tell you what significance there is in that. Because God doesn't do nothing by accident. Everything in the Word of God, I'm telling you. This is why I love when people try to, try to discount how miraculous the Bible really is and, and how incredible a document the Word of God really is. It makes me laugh. They don't get it. They, they aren't even close to understanding. God literally uses names. This is one reason why oftentimes, like if, if a child was to be born that God was going to use to do a certain thing, the Lord would literally tell the mother or the father or the parents ahead of time, and this is what their name is to be. You follow what I'm saying? Or he would turn around and he would speak to the individual and say, uh, name change time. Name change time. Abram! You're no longer Abram. I'm no longer going to call you Abram. From this day forward, you're going to be called Abraham. Well, okay, Lord, why are you changing my name? I'll tell you why. Because Abraham means the father of many nations. But funny enough, Abraham still didn't have any kids. But when God said he's going to do something, it's as good as done. Hallelujah. And God said, I'm going to change your name now because of what I'm about to do for you later. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? That's why as believers, hallelujah to God, God says you're holy. God says you're sanctified. God says you're ready for heaven. God says you're sinless even though you ain't. But He calls us saved. Hallelujah. He calls us redeemed. He calls us holy because of what He's going to do for us later. Hallelujah. Amalek was a descendant of Esau. Who was Esau? Esau was the brother who sold his birthright to Jacob for some food. There was a lot of animosity between Esau and Jacob. After Esau sold his birthright, he eventually kind of woke up and realized, wait a minute, I just gave away the farm for a bowl of soup. <laughs> I just gave away all of my inheritance as the firstborn son for a lousy bowl of soup. 
Well, how many of us have made some pretty stupid decisions in our life only to wake up the next morning and say, what in the world did I do? But you know what? It's too late now. You done made the decision, honey. You've already done the deed. You already signed the contract. You already bought the house, so to speak. Can't change anything about it. But Esau held a great deal of animosity toward his brother uh, Jacob. When we read of the founding of the nation of Israel, we read of the founders, we read of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Wasn't supposed to be that way. Should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Because Esau was the firstborn son. But he sold his birthright. So now, for all of eternity, Israel will be known as the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. There was a lot of animosity. This man, Amalek, was the grandson of Esau. Do you know what this passage is telling us? Listen to me now, you've got to hear this. This is good. You know what this passage is telling us? It's telling us that our past will always come back to haunt us. <laughs> oh, many, many years, many generations had passed. And yet that animosity between Esau and Jacob was still alive. But it was alive now through the descendants of the grandson of Esau. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? How many of us really struggle at times and really wrestle with things at times? And how many of us are nearly wrestled to the ground and defeated, not because of what's happening in our life today, but because of what happened in our life years ago? How many times have I had LGBT people in this church? Martin even has talked to me and said, Brother, sometimes I think about things I've done. I think about the past, you know. And, and it almost makes me feel so guilty that I, that I can't even continue as a Christian. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because the grandson of your past has come to attack you. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? That descendant of your past has come to attack you. How many of us wrestle with things that are not born in the present, but they're born in the past, and they still have the power to bring us down at times? My Lord, have mercy. Oh, but listen, the Word of God is more alive than just that. Where did the descendants of Amalek come? Attack the children of Israel. Well, in the wilderness of sin. Well, as believers, we're all wandering through the wilderness of sin. We live in a sinful world. It's going to be a sinful world till Jesus comes. It's going to be a sinful world until finally the Lord calls every man, every woman before Him in judgment. And the earth, the Word of God says, is renovated by fire. And He is going to recreate the entire heavens and the entire earth. That's what the Word of God says God's going to do. But until then, it's a sinful world. Until then, there isn't one of us believers that isn't wandering through a wilderness of sin. What are we trying to strive for? Where are we trying to go? We're trying to get where God's promised us we can be. Which is, we're still in the wilderness of sin. We're still in the world. But He's given us a place of blessing. He's given us a place of prosperity. He's given us a place of favor. Do you understand what I'm telling you? He's promised us a land that flows with milk and honey. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. That's not talking about heaven. That's talking about it right here in the here and now. God's prepared Canaan for us. When the spies went into Canaan, they found fruit so big they could barely carry it on their backs. They said, my God, there are vines that bring forth grapes and the bunches of grapes are so big that they have to carry them between two men on a pole because the Bunch of grapes, Johnny, are so heavy and so big. 
They have to be carried in that fashion. Said, so, oh, just like God said, metaphorically, it flows with milk and honey. Hallelujah. I got news for you. God's got a lot better place for you to live than where you're living now. God's got a lot better place for Christians to be than where they're at now. He's got a place that is separate from, but still we're still in a world of sin, but we're not part of the world of sin. And until God's people wake up and realize, hey, i got to quit acting like Egypt, and i got to start acting like God has delivered me, and God has set me free, and God has saved me, and God has given me a better place than what I had in Egypt. But Amalek, the descendants of Amalek, they didn't just attack the people of God generically in the world of sin. No, they attacked the people of God at a very specific place. That place is called Rephidim. Now listen to this. The name Rephidim has a meaning as well in the Hebrew. It means rests or stays or resting places. A station of Israel in the wilderness between Egypt and Sinai. When does the devil come at us with our past? Usually just about the time that we begin to rest. Usually just about the time that we stop running and we stop fighting. Just about the time everything seems to be going well. Am I telling the truth? Just about the time that you feel like everything's under control. And your life is going well. And you can finally breathe a sigh of relief. And all of a sudden something comes from your past. Hello now. And attacks you. Yep. Doesn't that happen every time? Yep. Good Lord have mercy. Do you see how God's word speaks to us in ways we can't even imagine? <laughs> and Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Moses goes. The next, get, the next day he goes to the top of the mountain, the top of the hill. And he raises the rod of God. What is the rod of God? That is the rod that bud. That is the rod that Moses threw down upon the ground and it became a serpent before Pharaoh. You remember? That rod represented the power of God. It represented the power of God. Everything God did for Israel through Moses, their leader, he did with that rod. When the Red Sea needed to be parted, what did Moses do? He raised up his rod over the waters, hello now, and the waters parted. Am I telling the truth? When the people of God needed water in the wilderness, what did God say? He said, take that rod and strike the rock. And Moses took that rod and he struck a rock. Well, that hadn't produced much water where I come from, but it did in the wilderness. All of a sudden, a little hole popped out, and water began to flow from that rock. Hallelujah. God used that rod in Moses' hand as a symbol of his power. God's power, not Moses' power, God's power. Moses said, I'm going to lift that rod up. He said, I'm going to lift up Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to lift up the Lord. And as you're fighting your battle, I'm going to be lifting the Lord up. Hallelujah. And what they found was, Johnny, that as long as Moses was able to hold up his arms, one with the rod of God in it and the other empty-handed. As long as Moses could hold up that rod, as long as his arms stayed in the air. Israel prevailed in the battle. But as he would grow tired and his arms would begin to fall and fail and they'd come down to his side, all of a sudden the descendants of Amalek would start to overcome the children of Israel. And Joshua's looking and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
I, I, I notice a correlation here. I see something happening. Every time Moses' hands are up in the air, we're winning the battle. But every time his arms come down, we start losing the battle. What does that tell you? That tells you we need to keep Moses' arms up in the air. Oh my God, have mercy. We better do something to make sure that Moses is able to keep doing what Moses is doing. Because when he does that, we wind up winning. So they put a rock on the ground and said, Moses, sit on the rock so you don't have to stand up here and be tired. He said, sit on the rock. And one man got Joshua got on one side. And another man got on the other and they held his arms up. So that Moses, no matter how tired he became, no matter how weary his muscles became, his arms could remain in the air. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And Israel ultimately won the battle. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the Word of God do we ever see the Lord appointing a committee or calling a conference. The truth is when the Lord, whenever the Lord has wanted to do something, whenever He's wanted to see something accomplished, He has called an individual to take the lead in the task. Am I telling the truth? He called Gideon to rise up and lead God's people into battle. Funny because when the angel of the Lord appeared before Gideon, he said, hey Gideon, he said, Hello, Gideon, man of war. Gideon looked down and said, What in the world are you talking about? I'm not a man of war. I'm not a soldier. He said, Oh, yes, you are. Why? Because I'm here to tell you God's got a job for you to do. Notice, Johnny, God didn't speak to a committee. God didn't speak to a whole bunch of Israelites and say, you're going to fight this battle. No, God spoke to one. He called Gideon to lead the battle. God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. Had the Lord not called Moses to do this, listen, had God not given Moses this divine directive and this calling, the people of God might have remained enslaved and oppressed in Egypt for centuries more. They may even have remained in Egypt until this very day. We've got people in our country today who got here because of slavery. And they're still here. They're no longer slaves, but they're still here. Had Moses not been called by God to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land, then the Jewish people might today not have their own nation, but rather they might still be part of the citizenry of Egypt. But that's not what God wanted. That wasn't God's plan. So what did God do? Well, he, he called a committee. He brought 35 men together and told them, no, he didn't. He spoke to one man. He told one man, I have a job and I want you to do it. Am I telling the truth today? I'm going to tell you, this is why we believe in a calling. This is why we believe in ministers and preachers and those who do the work of the gospel being called to the task. Honey, if God hadn't called you, you better not try to go out there and do something. Even if you think what you're doing is good. Even if you think what you're doing is beneficial. No. God has to call a man to the test. I'm going to tell you a little secret today. If God hadn't called me to affirming progressive ministry, I wouldn't be doing it. It took years. I've told you the story before. It took years for God to convince me that I needed to get into ministry that would reach out and help LGBT people understand that they can have a walk with God, that they can be saved, that they in fact can be Christians and they can live for the Lord and they can have victory and they can be blessed and they can be prospered and they can be favored by God. It took me years to come to that understanding. But I dare say, had I not done so, how many people 
in this room, how many people watching on the camera right now would not be walking in relationship with God today? Think about it. You know why, Johnny? Because God doesn't call committees. God doesn't call groups of people. God calls individuals. And He gives them divine directive. He gives them directions. He gives them instruction. He helps them to understand what He wants to do. And then He ongoingly leads them and guides them so that they can get the job done. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Right. My Lord, have mercy. Leadership is never easy. Satan has done today a marvelous job of causing the people of God to diminish or dismiss the importance and the necessity of God-called, God-anointed, God-inspired leadership. If I have a nickel for every time I hear somebody try to dismiss every preacher on the planet with these foolish garbage lines. Well, all them preach, they're just in it for the money. How many times have you heard that said? All oh, they just do it for the money. And they try to dismiss every individual who is engaged in the work of God. Every single one of them. They try to dismiss with that one phrase. The only problem is, some of us, honey, aren't in it for the money. Some of us are in it because we met God at the burning bush and He told us what He wanted to do and how He wanted to do it. And we're out there trying to do exactly what God told us to do. And I got news for you. Some of the folks in this room wouldn't be in church today at all if it wasn't for this preacher obeying God and doing what the Lord called him to do. Some of the people watching online today wouldn't have a relationship with God today at all. They still be condemned. They still be condemned convinced that God doesn't want them. God hates them. God despises them. All because of who they are. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for God having a conversation with one man and sharing with that one man what he wanted to do and more importantly how he wanted to do it. The job of leadership doesn't end when Moses walks in and says, Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. That wasn't the end of Moses' job. It wasn't his job just to get the Pharaoh to release the people of Israel. No, his job then was to lead those people from Egypt to the promised land. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Got news for you, honey. If you think that it is not essential that you have a pastor, if you think it is not essential that you be part of a church, you are an idiot. I'm just going to tell it plain. That's not at all what the Word of God says. I don't need anybody to lead me. Oh, really? How did you come to the cross to begin with? How did you find God to, to begin with? How did you begin your relationship with the Lord to begin with? Did you do it by yourself? Was there nobody involved? Did no one speak to you? Did nobody share with you? Did nobody spend years investigating and researching Scripture so they could bring information and enlightenment and education to you that would help you to see the light? Oh no, I, there was somebody who helped me. Well, I got news for you, honey. His job ain't over. Just because he got you out of Egypt don't mean that his job is over. No, you're still called to follow the leader. God set up governments in the church. God set up. You see, God don't, don't just tell you what he wants you to do, but he tells you how to do it. The Word of God said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Verses 17 through 24. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one or each individual, let so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being uncircumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. In other words, what uh, the Apostle Paul is saying is, if you feel that God has called you to be circumcised, well then, 
fine, be circumcised. But if you feel God has not called you to be circumcised, don't do it just because somebody else wants you to. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Yeah. My Lord, have mercy. Ooh. Let's continue. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man, listen, abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if this be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. What is Paul saying? It sounds a little confusing. Paul is saying every individual has on their head and in their life a calling from God to do a certain thing, to be a certain thing. He said, you be what God's called you to be. And don't worry about anything else. Don't even... Listen, brother, if God called you to be a plumber, then don't worry about mommy and daddy wanting you to be a painter. Do you follow what I'm saying today? If God called you to be a doctor, don't worry about mommy and daddy wanting you to take over the family business. You need to abide in the calling wherein you're called. You need to walk in relationship with God and you need to obey the voice of God and God alone. And he said for those who are involved in the work of the ministry, You'd better walk in the calling that you're called. Remember I told you about Brother Tatlock and how he said to me that day, So Chuck, where are you preaching now? And I said, well, Brother Tatlock, you know, I, I'm not really preaching right now, you know. He said, did God call you to preach? And I couldn't say no because I knew he had. I said, yes, he did. He said, when did he tell you to stop? Why did Brother Tatlock say that? Because let every man abide in the calling wherein he is called. If God's, ye, whoo, glory, if God's called you to do something, you need to do what God's called you to do. Got news for you today. When God called me into affirming ministry, when God called me to minister uh, reconciliation and salvation and healing and help to all people, but especially people in the LGBT community, uh, I was not real eager to jump into that task. You know why? Because I knew then it wasn't going to be easy. I'm not stupid. I knew then. I knew then it wasn't going to I didn't know how hard it was going to be, but I knew it wasn't going to be easy. Let's put it that way, okay? Yeah. A wife who loves her husband, an individual who loves their spouse, will also love their spouse's dreams, their ambitions, and the endeavors to which their spouse sets their hand. Johnny, Bill likes to work with his hands. He likes to do artistic things. He creates nice little decorative and uh, jewelry items out of paper. He actually has a, a way of doing and, and don't ask me how to do it because I'd probably make something, you know, <laughs> that looks insane. But Bill makes these beautiful things out of paper. I'm going to tell you those here. I know for a fact Johnny just loves the fire out of what Bill does, don't you? Sure did. You think what Bill does is just wonderful, don't you? You think, you think it's marvelous. And that's the way it ought to be. Because if you love somebody, you ought to love what they do. Hello now. You ought to love what they set their hand to. You're, you're not there to be window dressing. You're there to be supportive. You're there to be encouraging. You're there to, to share in the endeavor. Am I telling the truth today? But we've got a lot of Christians in the world today who say, I love the Lord. But they don't want to do nothing the Lord wants to do. And they sure don't want to do it the way the Lord wants to do it. Oh, I love the Lord, but I don't care to be part of a church. I don't want to be part of a church. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Really? That's funny because that ain't what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. The Bible said we're a body. 
The Bible said that no member of the body can say that it doesn't need the rest of the body. Hello now, isn't that what the scripture says? Isn't that what the apostle Paul says? That the eye can say hey, to the ear, I don't need you. I got news for you, honey. You may not realize it. You may not want to recognize it. You may not appreciate this fact, but you need the church. That's right. And furthermore, I got news for you. The church needs you. Yes. You may be a puckered up old. <laughs> I'm going to be nice. Sweat gland. There you go. <laughs> but the church still needs you. Because that puckered up old sweat gland helps to keep the church cool. It helps to keep the body cool. Am I telling the truth? You see, yeah. the Apostle Paul said, even the less comely parts, <laughs> even the parts that aren't so pretty, even the parts that aren't so glorious, even the parts we don't run around celebrating every day, you know, well, some people do, but said even those parts that are less coming, said they still have a function. They still have a purpose. They're all part of the body. You see, if you run around and say, I don't need to be part of a church to be a Christian, I got news for you, honey. You don't even know what being a Christian is. Because being a Christian is about being a cell in the greater body. And if you're disconnected from the rest of the body, you can't possibly be a Christian. Because to be a Christian, you have to be connected with the body. To be part of the body, you have to function with the body. And if you're functioning with the body, you don't meet people who have an arm that runs around pinching people on the butt and slapping people and doing things all by itself because it's functioning of its own will and its own mind and its own accord, do you? No, it don't work that way. Now, what controls what, what the arm does? The head controls. Who is the head of the church? Christ yeah. is the head of the church. How does the head of the church communicate to the body what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, when it needs to be done, where it needs to be done? I'll tell you how. Through the leadership that God himself has called to that task. Right. My Lord, am I telling the truth today? Yes. I told you this is more teaching than preaching. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, And why call me Lord? Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The Word of God declares in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What is Paul saying? Paul said, God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why do you turn tune in to listen to this old preacher get up here and bark on Sunday? Because you're striving, I hope, for perfection. Mm -hmm. 
Perfection doesn't mean without flaw. Perfection means mature. Perfection means complete. You, in other words, you're, you're, you're wanting to go beyond where you're at today and get closer and closer to where God wants you to be. Am I telling the truth now? Well, guess what my job is? My job is to help you get there. For the work of the ministry. There are things, Johnny, that I do on behalf of the body, on behalf of our church. Bring food to people who need food. Help pay for people's hotel rooms who, who uh, are struggling and going through a hard time. And I do these things because you've got to work. You've got things to do. You've got a life. God had not called you to handle those aspects of the work of the ministry. He's called me to do those things. But I can't do those things unless you support me. So that I can do those things. Well, what are you supporting me for? You're supporting me so I can do things you can't do. Mm -hmm. That includes investing hours and hours and hours every week in researching and studying the Word of God. That includes spending hours and hours every week praying for you and holding you up in prayer. Hello now. But you see, you support me. What do you do? You hold up my arms so I can keep that rod in the air. Why? Because as long as you hold up my arms, guess what happens? You keep winning your battle. Oh my goodness, are you getting this now? Yes. Are you starting to understand this now? we got Christians running around, and all they're ever doing is losing. All they're ever doing is, is they feel like they're being defeated. Oh, Bill, they feel like every time they turn their head, Oh, I'm going through such a battle. I'm losing the battle. I'm losing the battle. Uh, I can tell you why. Because God has called someone to lead you and guide you and help you. And you're not giving a fly about trying to help support that person so they can do what God's called them to do, which in turn would help you to achieve success, which in turn would help you to be blessed, which in turn would help you to have the victory. Am I telling the truth today? Yes. I'm going to tell you, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I was raised to hold my pastors in... I, I use the term high esteem. We didn't worship our pastor by any stretch of the imagination, nor did we see him as being able to walk on water, you know. But my pastor, that was somebody God put in my life for a very important reason. That man was there, uh, Johnny. I, I didn't believe for one minute that my pastor was there just because. No, I believe that he was there because God put him there. Do you follow what I'm saying? When he got on the pulpit, I didn't believe my pastor got up and preached just because he felt like saying something. Mm -hmm. I felt like he got up and preached because he'd been talking to the Lord and he had something to say that was going to benefit me and help me. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Yeah. When the pastor spoke, I reverenced what he had to say. I respected what he had to say. And when what he had to say hit me right between the eyes, and I got news for you, that happened fairly often. I didn't reject it. I didn't rebel against it. I knew that it was time to turn the dog around. Right. Hello now. Do you understand what I'm telling you today, church? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 27 through 29, no, excuse me, Paul said, now ye are the body of Christ. And members in particular. And God hath set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. Now, this term teachers is from the Old Testament word rabbi. So, in other words, it's inclusive of pastors. Teachers. Pastors are teachers. Okay? After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps governments. In other words, God put structure and order in the church. God's the one who established that there should be a hierarchy of authority and responsibility in the church. See, somebody didn't just wake up one morning and say, gee, I think the church should operate like this. There should be a pastor. There should be deacons. There should be elders. Do you follow what I'm saying? No. God's the one that set all this in order. Why? Because God news for you, honey. God knows what he's doing. You may not understand this, but I got news for you. When God builds something, it's going to work. It's going to function right. It's going to do. If 
it's done the way he wants it to be done. Amen. We got too many people wonder why things aren't working in their life. And the answer is simple. Because you ain't working it God's way. You're trying to do it on your own terms. You're trying to do it your own way. Paul said, uh, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? No. Everybody in the church can't be a preacher. That's why we have some that God has called to do this. Do you follow what I'm saying? Not everybody in the church can do all these things. The Jehovah's Witnesses, oh, they're cute. Unbiblical to the core, contrary to the Word of God, till it's not even funny. But they tell their people, oh, we're all publishers. We're all preachers of the gospel. Lie. That is a falsehood. Paul said, are all apostles? Are all teachers? No. We're a body. In a body, everybody don't do the same job. That's right. Some people are arms, some people are legs, some people are eyes, some people are ears, some people are noses. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. That's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, no, we've all got different jobs. But God has set people. God has set people. Let me tell you, if you're going to a church and you can't tithe and support it, then you're going to the wrong church. I don't believe my pastor's called of God. I don't believe my pastor has an anointing. I don't believe my pastor's acting in my best interest. I don't believe my pastor's hearing from heaven and bringing me a word from God. Well, honey, if that's how you feel about your church, you need to find another church. But don't you dare sit there and not tithe. Mm -hmm. Don't you dare say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't you dare sit there and not support that preacher. I got news for you. You try to go into Golden Corral and load up your plate and eat and walk out without paying. Yeah. Let's see how long it is before you wind up in jail. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny? You go into McDonald's, you pay before you get your food. We got people going to church every Sunday. We got people tuning into our broadcast every Sunday. We got people who come to church. Well, have had people that come to church. Not you folks. I don't want you folks misunderstanding me here. But we've had people come into this church. And boy, I mean, they got something from it every Sunday. Johnny, do you get something from this church? Do you get something from this pastor? Yeah. They get something every Sunday, but never once did they raise a finger to put a nickel in the offering plate to help the pastor or to help the church. This pastor's had surgeries, and I've been in the pulpit the Sunday after my surgery. I was talking to a man in my Uber the other day, and I told him, we, I, we were just talking about something, and I, I forget how it came out, but it was so nonchalant, you know. I said something to him. He, he identified as a agnostic, okay? And we were talking, and I said something to him about it. I said, well, you know, our church is small. It's very small. I said, I, I don't even have anybody that I can uh, turn to to conduct a church service in my absence. So, uh, if, if I'm not able to preach, you know, if I'm not able to do the, the ministry, uh, there's nobody that can fill in for me, so the people suffer because there's no word from God, there's no worship service, you know. And I said, a matter of fact, I had a gallbladder surgery two years ago Thanksgiving, and I said, and the Sunday after my surgery, which was on that Wednesday, I said, that following Sunday I preached. And I preached every Sunday after it. And he literally looked at me. I, I didn't think anything of it. I'm trying to explain to him how small our church is. That's what I was, you know, I wasn't bragging about being Superman or anything like that. I was just trying to help him understand how small we were, you know. And he said, you don't even know how amazed I am at what you just said. He said, why in the name of God would you get up and try to preach on a Sunday after you had gallbladder surgery, of all surgeries, on the Wednesday. Three days later, you got up in the pulpit and preached. I said, yes, sir. And the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. And I didn't miss one Sunday because of my gallbladder surgery. And he said to me, why would you do that? I don't understand. Why would you do that? You know what my answer was? I said, because God called me. 
to the test that I do. I don't do what I do because I want to do it. I do it because God called me to this job. I said, and you know, if you were a mother and you had children, and you had gallbladder surgery, and you didn't have anybody who could come over and help you, and you didn't have anybody who could come over and watch the kids, and you didn't have anybody, jo Johnny, who could come cook meals for the kids, I said, guess what that mother's going to do? She's going to get up and she's going to cook meals for those kids. She's going to do what she got to do. Because those kids still need to be fed, gallbladder surgery or no. I said, well, let me tell you a little secret. The people of God still need to be fed, whether I've had gallbladder surgery or not. I don't have any friends. I don't have any church members. I don't have people who are able to come over and pick up the slack. But because of my calling and because of my responsibility to the people of God, I got up in that pulpit and preached. I'm going to say it again. There's all kinds of people out there in the internet land who could care less. If they get online, Bill, and donate a dollar to help our church to say, Pastor, bless your heart. You're here, you are still delivering the Word of God. Here you are still holding up your hands. Here you are still doing what God's called you to do so that I can have victory in my life. Well, preacher, God bless you, but uh, the best you're going to get out of me is a prayer and a wink. Because I'm sure as all hellfire not going to do anything substantive. You can bank on that. I'm not going to come to church and be part of the church. I live in Dallas. I'm 20 minutes away. But I'm not going to drive down there and be part of the church and help you and support you. No, that would take too much work for me. I'll just tune in online. Yeah, because you get to eat without having to pay the check. Am I telling the truth? I told y'all, I said, today's message is true, and there's nothing in it that's negative, or, you know, I'm not trying to browbeat anybody, but am I telling the truth today? I'm telling the truth. We got people like, I don't understand. My life's such a mess. I'm a Christian. I live for God. I love the Lord, but nothing's going right. Nothing's going the way I'd have to go. I'll tell you why. Because victory is assured when you learn to hold hands. If you ain't holding the hands up of your lead, of the person God's called to lead you to the promised land, if you're not holding their hands up, you're losing the battle. Because the only time the people of God won is when what? When Moses' hands were up in the air. That's right. You can't just expect poor Moses. Well, Moses, you better find the strength, man, to keep your hands up in the air. How do you expect us to win, preacher, if you don't keep your hands up in the air? That's what most Christians act like. They think the preacher, oh, you have gallbladder surgery? Well, God bless you. Oh, you got a blood clot in your leg? God bless you. Did I call off church today? Ask Tommy how much pain I was in. Two days ago. Ask him how much pain I was in last night. Well, he wouldn't know because he was snoring and Tommy could sleep through a hurricane, earthquake, and the rapture all at the same time. I got up last night and let the dogs out, and I swear I was in so much agony, I was just, just howling all the way to this back door to let them out. And all the way back to the room. I was in agony. You know what I did on Sunday morning? I got up to preach. Because that's what I'm called to do. Because that's my job. And if I'm going to be part of the body, then the body got to function. The body got to do what the body got to do. My calling is more important to me than anything in this world. I'm going to, you better good and well believe. I know preachers called out of preaching over toothaches for Pete's sakes. Oh, my tooth was hurting this morning, so I asked Brother Jones if he'd handle the service. We don't have Brother Jones in our church. I can't ask Brother Jones to preach in my absence. So therefore, I've got to do what I'm supposed to do because I'm the only one that can do it. There are people online who are waiting for a word from God. There are people online who need their faith to be encouraged. There are people online who are discouraged and despondent. There are people online who are depressed and upset by what's going on in our world today, and they need a word from God. 
They need that leader to have his hands up in the air so they can win the battle because I'm telling you, if that preacher don't do what God's called him to do, what's going on in our world today is going to crush him. How many of y'all feel like what's going on in our world today about to crush you? I know I do. I know I do. There are people who have quit our church in recent weeks that I have absolutely no animosity toward in the least. Not an ounce. And I honestly know in my spirit the whole reason they quit is because what's going on in the world right now has crushed them. It just overtook them. It's more than they can handle. And I tell the truth. But you see, the way to victory is to hold up the preacher's hands. The way to victory is to help the guy that God has called to help you to do what God's called him to do so he can help you in the process. Yes. You know, the same people that quit are the same people who not one time in years, I'm going to say it, be offended if you want to, in years of attending this church, not one time did they tithe. Not one time did they put a nickel in the offering plate. I'm just telling the truth. I'm not lying. God is my eternal witness. Actually, there was one time that one of those individuals, maybe once or twice, gave an offering of like, you know, five, ten, whatever dollars, okay? I'm talking about in four years. Why am I losing the battle? Um, because the key to victory is when you learn to hold up hands. When you learn to hold up those people that God has put in your life for your benefit and for your spiritual help, when you learn to hold up their hands, you're going to find out you start winning. You're going to find out things start going better for you. I'm running out of time because I looked at the clock when I started and I do not want to go long today. Maybe I should make the remainder of this message part two for next Sunday because seriously, I don't want to go too long with this today. Let me read to you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If somebody didn't obey their calling, to preach the gospel. <laughs> Nobody be saved. Nobody. Because the Bible said it pleased God to employ what method to bring salvation to lost humanity? What method did God establish? The preaching of the gospel. What? God didn't set up door to door visitation and witnessing? Nope, he sure didn't. He set up the preaching of the gospel. That is how the, the salvation is brought to lost humanity. It pleased God that by the, the foolishness of preaching. People look at preaching as foolishness. God said, that's all right. It's that foolishness that brings salvation to the hearer. Lastly, this afternoon, and I guarantee you I'm done after this, Romans 10, 11 through 16. I'm going to wipe that smirk off. <laughs> Romans 10, 11 through 16. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, that includes you and I, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then, Paul writes, shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. If the church is to be 
If the work of the church is to be accomplished, it is essential that we do things according to God's design. You cannot reach the right end or the right destination if you're approaching that end or that destination from the wrong place. God has designed the way that He wishes for the work of the gospel to be accomplished. Do you know better than the Lord? Do you know better than God how things ought to be done? Do you dare think or suggest that you're wiser or more intelligent than the creator of the universe? Yet this is how so many Christians today act. What? Tithe? I'm not going to tithe. Are you crazy? Well, that's stupid. I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. Even though the Word of God said this is the, the pattern that God has established. This is the system that God set up so that His ministers could do the work they've been called by Him to do. Moses did not fight in the battle himself. He climbed the mountain and stood before God as the people of God were entangled and engaged in warfare. As he held up his hands, the people of Israel prevailed in the battle. When his arms would fall to his sides, the people of Israel would suddenly begin to experience crushing defeat. The God-called leader did what he was called to do. He was called to lead, not to fight. God didn't call Moses to be a warrior. He called Moses to be the leader to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. Am I telling the truth? He was called to serve as the representative of God before the people of God. While they fought, he held them up before the Lord. While you're out there in the world every day struggling and fighting and trying to win and trying to get somewhere and trying to accomplish something, I got news for you, honey. This preacher is in his car somewhere in Dallas or somewhere in Plano or somewhere in McKinney or somewhere in Oklahoma praying for you that you'd be able to do that very thing. Because that's part of my calling. It's part of my job. When the leader struggled to do what he needed to do, there were men who recognized the need to hold up Moses' hands. Too many in the church today see the God-called, God-anointed, God-appointed leader failing or struggling, and they do nothing to hold up his or her hands. And then they wonder, Johnny, why their church goes under. They wonder why they're affirming church closes its doors and they no longer have a church to go to. They wonder why Pastor Charles has to shut down the ministry and they no longer have a church that they can be part of online, that they can watch live on Sundays, that they can see hundreds of... Do you have any idea? You go to our you go to our YouTube channel and look at the hundreds of sermons that are posted. Do you have any clue in the universe how many hours of work and labor that represents? How many years that represents? Do you know how much effort that represents? And do you know how much support I've gotten over the last 25 years to do it? Bupkis. For most people. They wonder why their church goes bankrupt, why their church closes its doors. They wonder why their pastor backslides, or they lose the battles that they themselves have been fighting. Had they done God's business God's way, the victory would have been theirs. But you cannot do things your way, ignoring God's methods, and expect to secure victory. It simply does not work that way, folks. Victory is assured when we learn to hold hands. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?